If you missed our AMD R9 3950X Extreme Overclocking Livestream, you missed what's probably the best chip we've ever gotten for review in terms of silicon quality. Most of our review sample CPUs have historically been absolute garbage, and part of that is because early samples, contrary to popular misconception, are immature silicon, and actually a lot of the time worse than retail chips. In this instance, the 3950X is bidding and appears to reveal itself. In our stream, we first set forth to plot the frequency scale at a given temperature, which allowed us to better show how your cooler choice will impact the stock frequency of the CPU. We then embarked on our mission to overclock the CPU past 5 GHz, which we successfully did. We even had a timed run for Blender for a real production workload to see how Ryzen scales with frequency. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair Virtuoso RGB wireless gaming headset. The Corsair Virtuoso headset is comfort focused with a set of memory foam ear pads, headband, and lightweight construction. The Virtuoso wireless headphones use 50 millimeter drivers that range from 20 hertz to 40 kilohertz with a wireless connection that ranges up to 60 feet. Corsair also includes a detachable high quality microphone for voice comms. Learn more at the link in the description below. So for 3950X worked really well for overclocking. And all these CPUs are sort of binned as you get towards the higher end. AMD, it uses the same chiplets for everything, which is why its cost is so low and why it can afford to kind of product segment the way it does. And so what happens is as you get towards 3900X, 3950X, theoretically 3800X, those CPUs should have better bins than the lower tier chips. The lower tier chips are lower tier because they bend out worse in testing. And so the 3950X, although we don't have any meaningful sample size, obviously, so we can't really draw from conclusion, but the 3950X appears to be, be better binned, which would make sense. And ours, in the very least, uh, for the voltage required at a given frequency, it's just, it's pretty impressive compared to what we had for the 3900X and the 3800X. So we're pretty happy with how this specific 3950X worked out. Each one's going to be a little bit different today. We'll be talking about the results we got for extreme overclock and also the results we got for frequency scale versus cold. And that's important for you, even if you don't plan to do XOC, obviously, or even if you don't care about the overclocking part of the content. Because if you run the CPU stock, as we've stated several times now, all of these modern AMD CPUs are basically like NVIDIA GPUs and that they boost based on things like temperature and power budget. And so if you drive the temperature way down, you can boost it higher. And way down here is kind of relative because for every couple degrees, you get a frequency bump. So that could be the difference between going with, say, an ND15 or 280CLC and maybe a 120 air cooler. That's not so good. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. Let's start with the overclocking results. We used the MSI Godlike X570 motherboard this time with the latest BIOS, and we really have to give it credit to MSI here. The board was the best extreme overclocker we've worked with so far for Ryzen out of the motherboards we've worked with, especially with all of the new LN2 settings that help with cold bugs and cold boots. We were able to drive temperature down to minus 140 without any cold bugs, and we started to trip the crashes from cold reliably at about minus 170 degrees Celsius. In our previous work with a less mature Ryzen, we weren't able to go below minus 90 degrees without bugging out. The end result was that we were able to hold 5.3 gigahertz all core stable across all 16 cores and all 32 threads. If you're wondering what 5.2 or 3 gigahertz looks like at almost 1.7 volts, the power consumption for this, we, so for current we were at about 35 amps or so, and I think our maximum power consumption was almost 430 watts when we were really pushing it with Blender and with the higher voltage, higher frequency setup. Still though, to the credit of the CPU, that's actually pretty efficient because a 7980XE pushed similarly high, 4.8 gigahertz or so, was drawing about 500 watts in some of our earlier power consumption tests from the beginning of this year. So it's really not that bad. This is actually less interesting than our mid-step result though. At only 1.394 volts, we were able to hold 4.9 gigahertz all core. And to be extremely clear here, because when, when we posted an update to the YouTube community page uh, after the stream was over, there were some comments about like, wow, 4.9 gigahertz on Ryzen. I guess it's binned really well and rip Intel and stuff like that. So first of all, the second part can still, obviously Intel is in quite a bit of trouble, yes, but not because of that. And uh, secondly, it was with liquid nitrogen. So there seemed to be a lot of confusion about how the overclock was achieved, even though we had just finished a four hour live stream using liquid nitrogen. Uh, so to be very clear here, these clocks today 
are with liquid nitrogen. <laughs> and although we could hold 4.4 gigahertz all core with a 280 CLC and almost 4.5, which we could probably hold 4.5 with maybe a, a 420 or a 360 rad. And um, even though we could do that, we, we could certainly not do 4.9 all core. That's crazy without LN2. So anyway, let's get back into it. Uh, 1.394 volts for that. As a reminder, some of our other Ryzen 3000 CPUs required 1.4 volts just to hit 4.3 gigahertz all core. Our volt frequency scaling was extremely good on this chip. That 1.394 volt number matters more here than it would on some other chips with lower core counts because more cores and at this voltage just it gets really hot. So anyway, at 4.5 to 4.9 gigahertz, we could hold at 1.394 volts, which is really good scaling. And we had to increase voltage to pass 5 gigahertz. Here's our chart to show the blender result just for fun. We ran this for 10 minutes while taking super chats in the stream. In our GN logo render, the 3950X stock CPU required 12.2 minutes to complete this render, with a 4.4 gigahertz overclock requiring 10.3 minutes. The LN2 overclock dragged us all the way down to just 9.4 minutes, or a massive time reduction of 23% from baseline, and even still a 9% reduction from the 4.4 gigahertz overclock on air. And when we say on air in this context, it means using non-exotic cooling, so this would be a CLC280. We almost never see scaling this good out of LN2 overclocks in non-synthetic applications. It happens, but it's pretty rare in GPUs, for example. It's exciting because this brings the 16-core 3950X up to nearly parity with the 32-core 2990WX, allowing the 2990WX a lead of about 12 seconds. So clearly, the takeaway here is if you want a 2990WX in performance, all you need to do is buy a 3950X. You can save a lot of money by doing that. So you buy a 3950X, save a ton of money, and then all you need to do is spend about $500 on a Darebauer Beast LN2 pot. You spend about $180 on 180 liters of liquid nitrogen, maybe once every couple days or so, if you're running it nonstop. And actually, well, faster than that. And then maybe once every day. And then you probably need uh, maybe a $600 LN2 doer, $400 transfer hose, some thermoses, transfer cups, things like that. So as you can see, this is extremely practical and much cheaper than a 2990W, way cheaper than a 2990WX, yeah, ignoring all those other expenses. But it's still fun to see. It's In all seriousness, this is actually pretty damn cool to see the tile-based renderer uh, cycles in Blender scaling with frequency like this because it's tile-based. So for every thread you have, you get one more tile that'll start drawing things on the screen. With the 64 thread threader per chip, that's 64 tiles. That's two times as many as the 32 thread 3950X. So Baby Threadripper, as it was called in our stream by one of our viewers, is very competitive with proper Threadripper at these frequencies. And even though it's not realistic in terms of running it practically like that, to see that type of scaling, to basically to, to achieve what a CPU with double the core and thread count can do is, is pretty cool. It's, it's interesting. So uh, let's get into something a bit more practical because unfortunately getting frequency this high requires a lot of cold and that isn't practical. Uh, and that also means that we have to do things like drop the infinity fabric. So for Ryzen, there's this really specific issue where it obviously with every CPU in order to get higher frequency, you need to get colder. And on this CPU, in order to get colder, you have to eventually turn Infinity Fabric to 1467 megahertz. It can't do 1800 or whatever, even 1600 megahertz with those sub 100 degree Celsius temperatures. It just doesn't hold, it's, it's unstable. So we have to drop 1460 to 1467 for Infinity Fabric. And at minus 90 degrees, we can run it at full Infinity Fabric, but we can't get above five gigahertz because it's not cold enough. And if you're wondering why it's not cold enough at minus 90, it's because as soon as you click start on just Cinebench, you just click run, the temperature will spike by about 50 degrees, assuming the CCD numbers are accurate. So 3950X has some new numbers in hardware info. They read all the way down to minus 49. We don't know if it's accurate, but it, it looked like it might be close enough to at least get a ballpark estimate because it was pretty one-on-one -on -one with our LN2 pot temperature, so at least idle. So anyway, whether or not that's accurate, it's about a 50 degree spike as soon as you click run. So minus 90, minus, minus 50, uh, or 40 or so. And then as the test runs, it just it only gets worse and you'll lose stability. Anyway, before getting to the realistic stuff, back to the other chart. Our end frequency was 5.3 gigahertz at 1.67 volts and minus 140 degrees Celsius, 
which we reran later to get a score of 5311 in Cinebench R15. For a quick comparison, the 9900K stock CPU score is about 2037, 2246 when overclocked to 5.2 GHz. 7980XE at 4.5 GHz scores about 3419, and the 2990WX scores uh, 5138. We don't have a, a chart for that, that's just kind of quick reference numbers. We achieved 2990WX performance though on a 16 core CPU. Uh, also for reference, we don't have a chart for this either, but single threaded was 220 for 4.7 GHz and 229 for 4.9 GHz. And just to answer the question, why Cinebench R15, isn't there a new one? Yeah, there's a new one. It's irrelevant. People get really fixated on the fact that there's a new benchmark and they're like, why aren't you using the new one? So a couple things here. This is for something that it's not like we're using this for a review. This is liquid nitrogen overclocking data, just to really emphasize that point. And so what we care about is it completes quickly so that we can do a live stream efficiently. And R15 is a lot faster than R20 because there's less to do. And also that it has a lot of data we can compare against out just on the internet in general. From other extreme overclocks, R15 has way more than R20. And then finally, it is absolutely 100% irrelevant which one is used for this purpose. Uh, and we have blender numbers if you want some actual real numbers, just, just to kind of emphasize that point too. Okay, let's get into the other stuff. As for cold scale, this was tested with a completely stock 3950X, no changes at all. We shouldn't really have to explain this at this point, but this is Precision Boost 2 left to do its own thing. CPU is auto. This is not Precision Boost Overdrive. PBO is an explicitly different thing. We have a pretty long video explaining the differences if you care to learn them, if you don't already know. And what this will do is help show the performance scaling versus the temperature. So if you drop temperature a reasonable amount with your cooler, then you can reference this chart for where your, your CPU might perform. Each CPU is different. The SMUs are all different quality. So keep that in mind too. And uh, separately, this is using liquid nitrogen as a tool. So if you're one of the people who's like, Ugh, liquid nitrogen content, boring, that's not real, then this is the part you care about. Because what we're doing is we're using it as a tool to control the temperature. Using the LN2 doesn't just instantly set you to minus 198. Uh, so what we're doing, by controlling temperature, we, we basically kind of slow pour or don't pour at all and allow the CPU to get as hot as we want it. So we'll run it at 90, run it at 84, 70, above, above zero, uh, you know, down to 50. And maybe at 50 or so, it stops becoming a, an achievable temperature in most environments. And so then we scale it all the way down to minus 91 just to see what happens at that point. So that's what we're doing here at 84 degrees Celsius, which is where you'd be in a poorly ventilated case with a bad cooler, we ended up at about 38.25 megahertz all core. Dropping three degrees to 81 had us nearing an average of 38.50 megahertz with a drop to 73 degrees, holding 3,900 megahertz all core. We got another 25 megahertz at 68 degrees up to 39.25 and landed at 39.60 megahertz at 63 degrees. This is close to where we were in our review with the Kraken X62 CLC at full pump and fan speeds for reference, and that's a 280 millimeter cooler. Frequency climbed further to 4 gigahertz, all core at 55 degrees, 4025 at 50 degrees, then 4060 at 42 degrees. It appears as if there's a rough 25-ish megahertz increase in all core frequency for approximately every 4 to 5 degrees Celsius reduction, although some steps were larger than others. If you could cool your CPU to ambient temperature, which was 22 degrees for us and basically is impossible to cool to under normal conditions, you'd be at 4100 megahertz all core with stock settings, meaning no changes out of box. Literally put the CPU in and run it at that temperature. We stopped at minus 91 because we had to drop infinity fabric to 1467 to bring it colder, uh, but the scale topped out at 4160 megahertz average. If it's easier for you to read, we also have a table with these numbers instead of the, the line graph, and we'll just get that on the screen for a moment as well. So that'll be it for the recap. Thanks for watching. Pretty interesting stuff. The biggest takeaway is the, your cooler choice matters. We already knew this. We showed this with the 3900X previously, but you can get about 25 megahertz for every couple degrees. It's typically about four to five for a bump, 25 megahertz all core, which is substantial. And four to five degrees at the top end of the scale in temperature is not that hard to achieve. It's the difference between maybe 20 extra dollars and your cooler cost. Now, as for the rest, some of it, the scaling is more like nine degrees to get another bump. And then once you start getting towards ambient, you're not really gonna be able to achieve that temperature, obviously, with any reasonable cooler. So scaling still happens though. Our range was 3825 to 39 something. 
depending on where you want to stop, 4,000 even, and gives you a good idea of what you can expect out of the 3950X, different coolers, the extreme overclocking stuff. Really exciting to see our chip actually does well for once. So at, I, I should address this too. There'll be some, there's always really stupid immature comments on these types of videos. I don't know why specifically, I, I don't know. I don't know why people get like this about two billion dollar companies, but with Intel, it's always, when we overclock Intel, it's, it's always like, lol, only eight cores or whatever. So we'll, do, we'll try to do six gigahertz and people are like, lol, eight cores, who cares? But overclock AMD, it's, everyone's like, lol, 5.2 gigahertz, my 9900KS can do that with an air cooler. Okay, cool. But they're different CPUs though. <laughs> Completely different. The architecture is different. The core count's different in most instances. And if you're like, well, but the 3700X isn't different core count, then it's still a different architecture and it behaves much differently. So these things are not directly comparable. One gigahertz is not the same as one gigahertz on Intel and AMD. Each one behaves differently. So just wanted to point that out too because there's always the, the like, people who try to uh, express their need for self-validation through posting comments defending the company's processor that they chose because of the results in a liquid nitrogen overclocking stream? Like, seriously? That's what, that's what you're spending your time doing? Anyway, pretty cool results. So for the Intel 9900KS, we did an XOC stream on that. We tried to hit six gigahertz, got pretty close to that. And for this one, we passed five gigahertz, which is great news for the 3950X. The chip quality is really good on the one we got. Yours will not be the same. They're all different. Might be better, might be worse. and at uh, 1.4 volts or so, we were holding 4.9 gigahertz, which is the best we've seen yet for Ryzen 3000 in our lab. Now, others might have a different experience. But that's it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersaccess.net to support us directly, like by buying one of these shirts, our mod mats, which I just used to empty the water out of the Allen 2 pot on, or toolkits. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersaccess for behind-the-scenes videos. We'll see you all next time.